everybody. I think we're live. This is What Is This? The show where I get to the bottom of all the mysteries of your stuff. And I'm really excited about today's show. Um, I got all sorts of... and The feedback was amazing. I got some uh, updates on some of the things we talked about last week. I got some new stuff and uh, I got some new friends too. I uh, This uh, guy, Eli, in New York has been sending me all sorts of cool stuff and I'm so excited because it's exactly what I was looking for. It's the kind of stuff I was looking for. There's a lot of mysteries out there and uh, you know, you guys stumped me with quite a few. Plus, I'm going to get into a little bit of that about when... Uh, when an appraiser gives up on on finding more and I, i'll explain that you don't give up on what it is it's just it's it's there's certain questions about an item that it's not cost effective to figure out what it is but i still want to know and that's why the show because maybe some of you out there know so if you have any mysteries i'd really love if you send them to me josh at joshlevinespeaks.com if you have any items uh, art antiques collectibles anything odd tools whatever you have around the house that you can't figure out what it is or always wanted to know more about it and i think you'll get the gist of it if you watch a couple of these shows and see what i feature so today i'm sure you saw the uh the picture of uh let me see what I got here today for the, the money shot was this. Um, most of you went, yeah, that's a rusty metal violin. That's exactly what it is. It's a rusty metal violin. But I want to, uh, as a matter of fact, I have it right here. All right. It is definitely a rusty metal violin. And I bet some of you are seeing it right now and you're saying, hey, I know what that is. It's a, it's a door lock. Well, it's not. It, it has no lock mechanism. It has nothing, but you're close. All right. So this was purchased at a local auction along with another piece I've already talked about. Um, and that's very important to this piece. It came from an estate of a woman that was a docent for the Phoenix Art Museum. Her name was uh, Catherine Whiting, and it was actually her mother's Catherine Phillips. And when it was sold at auction, it was described as the door knocker, the door knocker for um, the artist Rafino Tamayo. Now, people, auctioneers and and uh, state sales and all that, they'll say certain things because it's what is purported to be true. It's what the family tells them. And anybody that's educated that goes to auctions knows that. And a lot of times they think the auctioneer is trying to fool somebody. And most of the time the auctioneer will tell you, this is what the family's telling me. Please do your due diligence and research. And this was the case in this case because it was a granddaughter saying what her mother was told by her grandmother. So when it was sold like that, it's an architectural element. So when I saw it, I was like, it's still cool. Okay. If it is truly a door knocker. All right. It was, this is a pretty big door knocker. And it supposedly came from a, a very well-known Mexican artist. And it was a gift. Uh, it was a gift to, to uh, Catherine uh, Phillips. And I was like, all these people have passed. You have, how do you figure this out? And do you bother? Is the story true or is it just a cool architectural element? And for, you know, a couple hundred bucks, it'll bring a couple hundred bucks and it's a great story, but is it true? So how do you find these things out? Well, first off, you don't just, you, you don't just write the, uh, the Rufino, uh, Tamayo appraiser, uh, art experts and ask them, hey, do you know anything about this guy's door knocker? I mean, it's just a crazy question. And then you look around and there's some museums, but you just don't want to come at them like that because first of all, your email would probably just get deleted. You have to you have to come to them having done all the work you can possibly do before you get there. So what could I do? I could Google, and again, I use the Google. I also use Yahoo. I also use Bing. I also use uh, Duck, duck, go or go, duck. Go. I use I use them all. Uh, I also use auctioneer sites, live auctioneers, Invaluable, Worth Point. There are so many sites to look up information, but a lot of times I start with Google. So with, in this case, I did. So what I did was I just went to do do do. You're gonna see my screen in two seconds. All right. I just went and I put in the artist name. Uh, Rafino Tamayo, 
uh, and I was I was like uh, does and Catherine Phillips do they have any relation to each other and oh my goodness the first thing I well, the first thing that jumped out at me was Catherine K Phillips and that she wrote the foreword to his book and I'm like that's really cool. By the way, this first book will come in a little later in another another story. But anyway, so she wrote the foreword to his book. She did know him, and I did find out that she was, in fact, a docent at the uh, Phoenix Art Museum, and which so that story rang true. And I also found out that she was, uh, I think it's friends, she brought a lot of the artists in. So See here, I found her obituary. She had passed in 2009, and she was the former president of the of the uh, F, uh, Friends of Mexican Art, and she did introduce a lot of artists to the Southwest and uh, the Phoenix Art Museum. So everything sounds good. It sounds really good. So was this the door knocker? Was this the from his home as it was? So now I'm at the point where I can contact, um, he has a, a large gallery dedicated to him. He's pa since passed. Uh, I can contact the gallery in Mexico and see if they would write me a letter of authenticity, if they know it, or look through their archives and see if there's any photos of this piece being there. Because provenance is everything. Because just to give you an example, and as an appraiser, my opinion, which is just that, it's my opinion, this is an architectural element uh, because it's handmade, hand forged, probably 1960s. Uh, it's all handmade. And someone looking for large architectural door knockers like that would probably pay in the right setting, probably three, four hundred dollars. If we can prove that it was in fact the personal property with a photograph or verified with an affidavit from someone that knew them while they were alive, which is still possible, you're probably looking eight to $1,200. So you have to, a couple of emails worth that? Yes. Um, would a trip to Mexico and a, an investigation uh, be warranted? No. However, if anybody wants to budget that for me, uh, I'd be happy to go. It'd be fun to track these down. That'd be a great show. Somebody contact CNN and maybe I'll have a half an hour show doing that on Sunday nights at 11. Anyway, let me get on to the next thing I want to show you. As a matter of fact, what I want to do, should I do my, no, I'm going to make you guys wait for my recap and I want to get into some of the stuff that was sent in this week because uh, let's start off with something that Eli sent over. All right. Uh, he's got a couple of really cool pieces here that are going to show you what an appraiser does. All right. I saw this piece. A couple of these pieces were sent in. There were a couple pieces of art right here. Immediately when I saw them, I knew who the artist was. I try to not look at what um, I've learned that when I get an appraisal, uh, a request in or a, what is this in to not see what the what the client tells me because I want to come up with my own assertion first uh, because I don't want it to skew my way of thinking. So this didn't this doesn't come into play here because when I saw this, I knew immediately that it was Toulouse Lautrec, the famous French artist. And I knew from the from the image I had seen this first one before meaning it's a print and we know it's not an original drawing by the artist it's a known piece and to my knowledge there were 20 in the edition now the thing that i had to go to the email about and whenever you send me art i always ask is what are the dimensions and in this i believe it was approximately four by six i could refer back to the now and that was odd because the known uh, dimensions of this are larger okay of the of the print that this was of now that could mean one of two things it could be uh, an open edition print which means a print that might have been in a book and they just made a lot of them or it might have been another edition where there's a, it's just a lesser known edition i could not find 
this listed in a list of prints that were produced by the artist's estate. That doesn't mean it's this is over. The ghosting around this image was very intriguing to me and the color red in the in the stamp. Now, generally, this estate stamp of, of Toulouse-Lautrec is usually, when it's in red like this, it's usually on either an original work or produced by the estate. After he passed, they did some limited runs of of prints, and I thought that's what it. I thought that's what we were dealing with here. This one really intrigues me, and this one requires more research. Again, I know they're from the same series or run because of this border. All right, now they are in a frame. They are mounted. Apparently, they should be removed from the frame and inspected. Uh, outside of the glass. That happens a lot in this situation because you really need to see what's going on. One, were they attached? Is there any notes? There could be notes on the back. They may not be mounted. They may not be glued down. They might just have art art paper. But this is a case of these need to be taken apart and looked at. I was hoping that I would find this exact edition in this size. But what's really interesting, and I know there's a lot of art experts and, and experts in general that watch watch a lot of my YouTube videos. If any of you have seen this image, let me know because that would really probably help me narrow it down. I know I know they are prints or um, or uh, lithographs, but they are they're early for sure. I don't know if they're book plates, if they were out of a, a set that was sold in a box set, but they they might have some value. So I would definitely dig a little more into these. So they're pretty exciting. But again, we know what they are. It's just we don't know what edition they are. Does that help? All right. Let me see what else we have here. Oh, love this piece. Also sent by Eli in New York, which I found out Eli might be like a lost brother. Really strange story. His father had a very similar upbringing to mine, uh, collected a lot of stuff like mine. He plays guitar like me and uh, weird. Anyway, lots of other weird stuff too. I won't get into, but I have a pen pal now. So this is really cool. Okay. First glance at this, I thought it was a watercolor and it sure looks like one. Again, I'm not inspecting these things in person, but I did, you know, I, I'm fairly confident this is a watercolor and for a couple of reasons. And this is usually where I'll I couldn't find this exact image. He sent me great photos of it. This worked perfect for me. And he gave me enough here of the artist. Again, I just looked and I saw FW. Now this one's a little easier for me because it says FW Top Ham is what I got out of it. And it looks to say 1834. All right. So what I did, and again, the, this is where I'm going to get you these great cheats that you guys could use. All right. So. All right. Oh, I see. Uh, are we good? Hey, if anybody can see me right now, if you're having issues and I'm just talking to myself, shoot me a text in the chat. I see Mike's out there on Facebook. I see some, but I just let me know that YouTube's streaming if you get a chance. Anyway, I'm going to go back to what I did here. All right. I'll show you right here. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so we have FW. Where'd my Google go? There we go. I'll just pull another one over. I go to a site called AskArt, and I'm going to show you something really interesting. And I say interesting. This is a great cheat. This is a very expensive pay site, okay? It's called AskArt. Now, AskArt probably won't like me telling you this, but I'm gonna. So AskArt, you go to AskArt, and it has you find artists. This is a pay site. It costs you, oh, perfect. There you go. I can see you on Facebook. I'll try again on YouTube. YouTube is still not streaming. Okay. That's an interesting thing. John Kastner says, I look good. I love you, John Kastner. Anyway, uh, the, so I, I didn't have my just for men today. So, you know, so I hope YouTube's up. That's weird. The, um, but that's okay. If only Facebook sees me, you're blessed. So I have right here, Askar. Now, what did we have? We had FW Top Ham, right? So here's a site. Again, this is an expensive site, but they offer you some free tools. I don't think they mean for them to be free, but they are. So look at this. 
I see what I think says top ham. So I start typing top ham and I go, oh, there's some top. Wait a second. Did I see an FW? FW top ham. Well, that sure likes, looks like an FW top ham. Let's see what he does. Oh, I don't see anything here. Okay, they're not showing me because I didn't I didn't pay. Okay, let's let's but we we have an idea who this artist is. So let's let's look at this artist. Let's go back to the the Google and let's just do an image search. Wow. It sure looks like the type of art that this guy did, doesn't it? Let's go back and show you that image. Boop, 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 boop. Come on. Really? I know you want to click for me somewhere. Okay, you don't have to. Take a look at that image. Take a look at my girlfriend. She's the only one I got. There we go. So, you see right here what we got going on? That image? See the style of art? Very similar. Now, I always ask this question. Okay, it's a, we know this piece is a watercolor. So I go, did he do watercolors? Because if he was only known for oil paintings, it could be up. Uh, yes, he does watercolor. Very similar. Check these out. Look at, look at this image right here. Very similar. And what I like is I'm not seeing the exact image. So I had a question here. I want to know, are there prints? And when I look for prints, I'm like, there are some posters, there are some prints, but not a lot of giclés or prints. As a matter of fact, most of the prints are black and white, and they were not done in the in our era. So they're earlier, they're print, and they're not colored. So I'm I'm 99.9 .9 sure that this is a watercolor, just because he inspected it in person. But I'm also going to do something. Here's my next step, and you'll like this one. I go to Live Auctioneers. Live Auctioneers is a free platform to check out auctions all over the U.S., all right, and the world. So the cool thing about them, they have a free search engine. So you do have to sign up. You do have to sign up, but you can then see the prices. So I go to see this, search all prices realized. Now I'm going to sort this by the highest price, just like I would with eBay. And I'm looking and he's got 18 results. So I'm going to, we, a lot of times auction houses do not put the full name in. So I'm going to drop the middle name and I'm going to add watercolor. And yes, I say water oddly because I'm from Pennsylvania and it's spelled W-A-D-D-E-R, water. So I'm looking for a top ham watercolor. And I go to my price results. I sort it by the highest price. And here we go. We have this watercolor right here brought $2,800. These were passed. It means that the auction did not accept the bid. But you can see this is a very similar in size, scale. The date's 1870. I believe the date of the piece we were looking at is uh, 1884, I believe. 18, 1854. All right. So my gut tells me this is probably right. A thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. If it in fact is a watercolor, and I look to see where it was sold. It was sold in Iowa, so it's not the art capital of the world. No offense, Iowa. Actually, there's some really cool art museums. Jackson's actually a really a great auction house. But so it tells me that's probably where the ballpark is $2,800 could have been an anomaly. But again, I tend to go conservative. So if someone was asking me what I would think it was worth, I would say a thousand to 1500. And if it sold for $2,000 at auction, God bless America, everybody be happy. So, but that's probably what you got there. So what I look for is this artist, it's a watercolor. The price point tells me it's probably not a print or a reproduction or a forgery because most forgers would not forge a thousand dollar painting. So if we found a watercolor and it was $20,000, it would definitely have to be scrutinized, uh, be taken apart, checked out. I would still, again, any reputable auction house is still going to do their due diligence. But again, 
$1,500, what is your due diligence? You're going to spend an hour looking at it. You're not going to spend, you're not going to forensics done on a $2,000 piece, correct? You get it? Okay. Makes sense. Trust me, some people expect you to do forensics on a, on a, on a $2,000 piece. So let's see what we have next. Okay. This, that's interesting. Eli sent me a lot of cool stuff and I, I am emailing back and forth with him to let him know, because again, if you send me stuff and I know what it is or a value or a ballpark, I'm going to let you know. Here's another cool one that'll show off the art, the free art search. Okay. Here's one, uh, Venetian canal scene again, appears to be a watercolor the way it's matted, the way it's framed. You see the dimensions here. All right. Really cool. So I see this name again. I tell this to people all the time. I do not know every single artist that ever existed. No one does. There is no art expert. Uh, there's a book called Davenport. If you're ever bored, look at actually Ask Art. If you look at there, I, I think they say how many artists they have in their database. It's a half a million artists. Okay. Nobody knows them all. So most art experts you'll find specialize in a genre. They'll be like, I know French Impressionists, or I know contemporary artists, or I know modernists, or I know, you know, that's their, or 19th century landscape artists. They'll say, you know, that's their expertise. I have a friend that's a Russian uh, Impressionist artist. Uh, so, you know, hey, you can see it. Thanks, Mike. Awesome. We're back. So there's a lot of things like that, that, uh, that they're specialists in, but some people just have a good eye. I have a good eye with like, I can usually spot a good piece or know it's worth looking up, but I've done that a million times and found out that the artist was worth $50. So anyway, let's go on. So you see this now I can't make out that last name verbatim, but you don't need to, when you know how to cheat with ask art. That's what I should call this episode, Cheat with Asgard. So what I'm going to do is open up Asgard again. They may shut this feature down after they see my video. I don't know. We'll see. So I don't know who this artist. They have this other great feature, which I didn't show you. So I know it's his last name, I think, started M. Let's see. What did it start? M-U-L-H. But I want to show you for another reason. So M-U-L-H. All right. There's a bunch of artists there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it one step further. So see how it gives me all the M-U-L-H's? All right. What I do is I go, let me downsize this. I get my M-U-L-H, but I also have it, the first initial S-A. I'm sorry, S and then A. So I'm just going to put the S in and see what I got. Are any S-A's? Lo and behold, there is an SA. There's a Samuel and there's a Sydney. I'm going to go with Samuel because when I look at the image, it sure looks like a watercolor, very similar. Uh, and so I click on them and here they're actually giving me some free examples to look at. And they sure look a lot like our friend here. All right. So do, do, do. Oh, you. There we go. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, we're still on top ham here. All right. Oh, we're getting to that one. So you see the piece here. All right. You see what we got? Check it out. Very similar. Now I'm going to look at the signature. All right. Because now I'm going to say, hey, is this signature correct? So let's see what I got here. Oh, you want to know what the black guitar behind is? Uh, I'll tell you, it's a reverend. It's a Reverend. I can't remember the model name, but it's a Reverend. It's my favorite guitar. I should know the model, but it's not a Les Paul. All right. So I'm looking at this artist, and now I'm going to go to Live Auctioneers, and I'm going to put in our Mulholland friend. I got people texting me. They're probably saying, hey, where did you get that great shirt? Nobody's saying that. Um, Target. It was $6. Here we go. I put in this artist, I bring up his auction records, they're showing me prices, and I'm I'm seeing what I'm seeing, I'm seeing, and this, this, you can sort it by the best match, the highest price, I usually sort by the highest price, one, because I like to excite myself, and two, because I like to see what is the top dollar pieces, where they sold, and 
why. So one, it's an education. I'm learning what to look for. And two, I'm looking for where they sold. And because it can matter as much as the internet has made us um, um, na- global when we sell things, it still matters for a lot of different things. So anyway, you see the piece we have, it's very similar to this. What did it sell for? $400. Okay. So now I want to know what did the signature look like? Oh, it was just a monogram SAM, which again, when you got time on Askart, you can figure it out from SAM. So now I want to look at some others. I want a signature. I want to compare it to something. Okay. I see that signature and let me show you. And I'm like, I like the similarities, but I'm not sold yet. Okay. You see the, the S and the A, I'm looking at the A and the tails and the M and the tails, and I'm not sold, but from the artist using a monogram and the artist using, he made, again, if you're prolific and say you work, you painted, my signature has changed over, over my 50 years on the planet. So it might be a, and then I, I look for other examples and lo and behold, this one looks a lot more like this one. Okay. But again, I still look at little indiscrepancies like the N, I didn't mean for it to blow up. The N on the N there, if you notice is capital, uh, capital style. This is lowercase style. So again, I just keep going through the signatures. My gut tells me this painting's authentic. There's nothing to worry about because again, why would you forge? Aha, here we go. Now we're looking a lot more. You can see that he does, he changes his, I like that he does the dollar sign with the S. It's kind of a strange thing. I don't think that's what he was going for. But anyway, you'll see his signature is different on a lot of pieces. And it can also mean that some of those pieces might have been a little uh, suspect. But again, we know that it's a British watercolor of an of a known listed artist, but they're not terribly expensive. So again, I, we know what it is. Really cool though. I love this stuff. And I love that it shows you how that you can use where did my screen go? There we go. That you can use the um, these tools to figure it out and it didn't cost you anything because I tried one. I used to have all these tools, but after I went out of business, I couldn't justify or afford these tools. So if I could do it for free and show you how to do it for free, isn't that better? So yeah, I love it. Anyway, let's get on. What do we got next? I had somebody yelling at, oh, here's a mystery piece, and I'm looking for help from you guys. Again, from our friend, his father has an amazing collection, if you haven't noticed. And uh, his father reminds me a lot of my father. He was an antiquer for years and, and just has stuff all over him, outbuildings full of stuff. This you may recognize or may not recognize. That's as us. But it is a ship mast. It goes on a ship mast. It's the head that you may recommend you may uh, recognize right here. And I want to show you what we have on it dimensionally, because this might help some people. All right. This one is one of my favorites um, that was sent in. I thought I had the right up in here. I just want to give you the dimensions. You know what? I will email you the dimensions if any questions about it, but it is a full, full size mast. It is a sure period. To me, it appears to be 18th century. Um, it, it might even be earlier. It's a great piece. We're trying to figure out the character. Okay. Lots of speculation. I know Eli thought it went down that road. Uh, I don't believe so. Dollar to me looks Dutch or um, it almost looks like a scholar, uh, more scholar or religious as a figure, which is very unusual for one of the um, pieces I found. Now, let me tell you, when you look for ship, the ship heads like this, I did searches for ship heads with, you would not believe. I found websites that, this is a bad example. Hey, there's a cool tattoo though. I will show you, look for arms. I look for gentlemen. I look for priests. I look for Columbus. I look. So then what I did is I went through oil paintings because a lot of times I 
through art because art. So I looked. Looked for everything was a dad, but I found I found a mate the first time I found Pinterest almost helpful, and I was like, if Pinterest solves this for me to be elated, but I found 900 mastheads, okay, 900 of them, not a single one. Now, again, you have to remember these were unique to the vessel, these were you know, mass produced, like today, it would be like, here's the BMW emblem. These were very personal to the ship. So I know someone out there knows the cool, uh, one of the things Eli said, he's going to contact Mystic Seaport. That is a great place to, I, I really suggest that. Also, I want you guys to know there's a lot of auction houses out there that have free tools. Um, Heritage, Christie's, Sotheby's, all have an area on their site where they'll do what they call a free appraisal. Now, let me tell you how it works. If they're interested in consigning it, you will hear from them. If they're not, you won't. And sometimes their dollar figure is so uh, what they're looking for. They're looking for an item, you know, ten thousand dollars plus. So if you have a really cool seven thousand dollar item, they're not back to you. However, the mid-size auction has have who phenomenal with these things and sometimes better than the big houses because the, it's their specialty. I saw that Skinner, which is in Boston, has the record uh, auction results for this. I'll show you what I'm talking about. It's another way I research who best to sell something for a customer or who best to find what this is. So, oh, let me show you. So, figurehead. So, I just look up figureheads. It's kind of like researching on to be useless for a piece like this because maritime might be Dutch or Flemish, but check it out, $85,000, $50,000, $17,000, okay? So you're looking, and I look, who were the Skinner in Boston, Charles Miller, Boston Harbor Auctions. So if I had a piece like that, Eli, what I would do is contact two museums because you are you might be interested in selling and they're going to give you their expertise, something they handle all the time. So I've narrowed the focus down, and that's and again, it could be, you know, as it could be one of these two. I'm you know, and again, a lot of times I I try not to get people too excited. I I I never want to be the antique roadshow and say this could be a hundred thousand dollars because there's one that's over a hundred thousand and most are twenty five hundred dollars. This, my gut, if somebody asked me to do an appraisal on it and I had just walked in for like an appraisal fair, I would say four to six thousand dollars just to be conservative. Uh, just to give you an example, because there are so many, there's so much data backing up me saying four to six thousand dollars, and if I was doing an insurance appraisal. I would use all this backup data to to justify what I'm saying. But again, that wouldn't shock me at auction at the right auction. You know, an auction that specializes in maritime things like this to command that kind of money. So that could be nice. That buy you a lot of guitars. That would definitely buy you a lot of guitars. All right, what do we got next? Let's see. I'm going to jump over. I'm going to go over to my buddy Mike in Michigan who's got some cool stuff. Do, 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 do. All right. Mike from Michigan sent me a bunch. Today should be, I can't figure this out with, with Josh Levine, not what is this. But anyway, I like that just as much as, but again, if you've noticed, I can hone down where it is. I What I did with this episode is I tried to spend like no time with this. As you see, the, Fred, the mass piece got me hooked you know, which that happens with these, but I try, I'm trying to show you more. This is only my second episode. I'm trying to show you more about how I do what I'm doing. Uh, so you guys have an idea of how to research it yourself versus backtracking. Again, I'm going to be playing with this show for a while. It may end up just being 
let me show you the cool stuff people sent in that I have no idea what it is. But no, I think I think we're gonna I think we're gonna solve a lot of mysteries together. Especially being when we I get back in this piece, I got a lot of feedback from a lot of people telling me a lot of really cool, giving me leads. Let's say so. All right, Mike's got some cool stuff here. The first one he sent me, I thought would be cake, and I should have known better than when he said, "I can't figure this out." That I. I don't know. I'm usually pretty good. And when I see a coin, I go easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But guess what? Not so. 1975 bug, 250 cent. Now, what that means, I'm sure he means the $2.50 gold piece size. This isn't Mike's writing. Mike got this, I'm sure, at an auction or something. It says 24 carat gold bug, all one word, first issue, 1,000 pieces. Again, you know what that says to me? I don't know. because, And I don't mean it says, I don't know. You never believe what's on the outside of the package. Because again, somebody could have been fooling somebody 50 years ago. So on the backside, it says, United States of America, gold ban, 1933, repeal 1974. Now I know what that is. That was actually like an act of Congress where they ban gold and like ownership of gold and they didn't make gold coins for a long period of time. So it's like a, a, a commemorative coin for this gold band. So I was like, okay, that'll be easy. 1974. I was like, this'll be, this'll be cake. Kind of like switching this picture should be cake. And it's not, I don't know why, please. You're embarrassing me clicking mouse. All right, whatever. I win. So we go to, the Google. And I know what I know because it says it right on it. And again, I, I don't look at anything that it says on the package yet. I do, I do break down and look at the package when I don't know. So it said 1975 gold. I put exactly what it says on it. gold bug and, and see it, it's wanting to separate the word golden bug, but on the coin, it's not. So, but I'm looking gold bug, gold bug, gold bug, I don't see anything, and then I go to images, and I don't see And I thought it would be the first thing on there, and I should have known better. Mike wouldn't have sent it to me if that's what it was. So I looked at that, and then I was like, okay, maybe the 1974, maybe it's 1974 because it, and sometimes it's that simple. I'm like, nope, it's not 1974. And then I'm like, oh, wait, okay, it said there were only a 1,000 made. Sometimes people put that in. There's a thousand and you literally throw in a thousand and you, oh, we go, we got new pictures, but guess what? Still don't have that piece. I wrote to two different coin collecting groups about this piece. Lo and behold, they didn't have it. They all said, I have no idea. It could be a fantasy piece. They said it's probably in the metal experts would probably know. And when they say metal, like people who collect exomia, they collect metals, table metals, tokens, not coin collectors. They thought to ask those groups. So I did post it on Reddit. If you're not familiar with Reddit, it's a great tool, except for the fact no one answered me about this, but it's a great tool for finding out some really cool stuff. It's uh, Reddit and Quora. If you're not familiar, Reddit, join Reddit. It can't hurt. Reddit's like, uh, it looks like a, a Facebook that's broken. That's what I call it. But it is super nerd. It has a community and a group for everything. Anything you want to know facts about, or if you want to know every conspiracy theory in the world, just go to Reddit. They're all on there. And they break them into these groups. So you'll see I'm in the antique group, the auction group, audiobooks, bankruptcy. Yeah, that's a fun one to be in. Very depressing. Uh, book suggestions, conspiracy theories, because one of my blogs, don't ask. Uh, I just wanted to post it there. See if I get anybody really jazzed, but it didn't work. Costco, hoarders, blah, blah, blah. That's insane. New YouTubers. So everything on there but they're in the antique groups, but I found there is a group for everything. So I was looking for this gold bug coin. And if I type in the right space, gold bug 24 K, I was like, maybe they'll have it. Silver bugs, almost 24 K nothing there. And there there's nothing on it. I sent into two groups. I've yet to hear back. So I'm hoping to follow up 
with Mike with the answer for that one. Again, thought it would be cake. Here's Mike's next one. Love this. Now, Mike knew a lot about this. Um, here is a tile. All right. He sent it in. It's a green tile. It has the initials RFPSP on it. Uh, because it was Mike, and I know him, I read what he did in his research. And sure enough, uh, it, it came from the, um, it's from the Vatican. Uh, but we're trying to figure out what it is, where it would have come from the tile. And it was from the Basilica, I believe. Hold on two seconds, I'll tell you. Because I got off on a total wild goose chase with this one. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, Reverend, it's St. Padre. Yeah, St. Peter's Basilica, I was right. So it came from St. Peter's Basilica. And when I saw that and he said that, again, like I always tell you, it puts things in your head. And my immediate reaction was, it's a tourist piece. Now, what I mean by that is, it probably was in one of the, it was probably in the building at one point, And during one of the renovations, it was removed. And pilgrims who travel to the Vatican, just like, you know, they travel to Jerusalem, they travel, they travel to the Vatican and they want a souvenir. And it was very popular during the um, turn of the century. It was called the grand tour period where they would go to, they would go to Europe and it was like to see the Vatican and see, see the Holy land and see. So during this period, people were going, you know, there and taking things back with them. And so literally like a merchant would be on the street going, I have a tile from the bathroom of the Basilica and people, Oh, I need to have that. And this, and, and today there's still a million souvenirs they sell. If you go there now, there's still a ton of souvenirs you can get. There's still, but this piece in particular I knew it had age to it. So I thought that that made it a little different. So I wanted to be able to date it. And I immediately, I ran into some interesting stuff. And let me show you what. So Mike had sent me this a couple days later. And this is right off the Basilica, which you'll notice. Do, do, do. This is right off the Basilica. So you can see. I never thought I'd say right off the Basilica, straight out of Compton, straight out of the Vatican. So you have RFSP, RFSP, and the crown, and you go, okay, so you just look at it and you go, okay, yeah, that's the symbol. Look closely, okay? A lot of the details not there. And specifically, look at the keys. See how the keys are turned outward? So immediately, I went, uh, I went, uh, angels and demons. And I said, is there a code in there? Is there something in there? Now, and what it is, it's a way to date it because the coat of arms, the papal co coat of arms and, and the Vatican, just like, uh, just like royalty had different coat of arms for different papals, uh, papal reigns of the popes. And they all had different. So I was thinking it might be that, but it wasn't. And then there was the Basilica. So I'm like, no, I'm off on a wild goose chase, but I'm like, there's something with those keys. And what I knew that would do was at least help me date it. So I looked for where can I find, okay, there's the keys. Oh, I got to go through how prepared I was for this show. But you know what? You still love me and you're going to bear with me. Where is it? I moved it in a different screen. I know. Oh, no, there it is. Aha, it's a different kind of file. Check that out. See that? See the keys turned out? This book, this is a, a book of, on the mosaics that are featured in the Basilica and in the Vatican. And guess what? This was published in 1923. And I found then the keys and this symbol is the same up here. And in late 19th century, it's completely different. So I know that it's in that period. I know that that's where it's from. And what I would call this piece is a grand tour, uh, a grand tour souvenir from the Basilica. That's, that's definitely what, what it is. And it was definitely a building material that was from one of the renovations. And I'm sure if you want to dig Mike, you can definitely find all the times it was renovated. They, I found in Italian, I found PDFs talking about 
all of the times and all of the renovations. They are literally documented and online and available. And you can run a Google Translator and see what renovations were done to St. Peter's Basilica, believe it or not. So if you want to get that crazy and go, hey, this came from the uh, upstairs bathroom. But again, the piece itself, probably a couple hundred bucks, knowing what you know now, which is pretty cool. This is my favorite piece that Michael sent in. Only because I believe it's from my my home my home state of PA. All right, Mike it told me that he got this uh, this piece while on his honeymoon tour. That's a weird thing. I don't know how it just did that. Let's try that again. That's the strangest thing. Double vision. I see double vision too. All right, I'm going to try this. Close. Oh, I see. All right. No, it just wants to double vision it. So you're going to have to look at two of my guess. No, there we go. All right. So when he sent it over, he said he got it in Pennsylvania. It's redware, stone, like a stoneware uh, crock, but it has this really unusual. And he's like, I can't find anything on it. There are no marks. There's no maker's marks or anything. Um, let's see. Right here. It is. Oh, I say. Thanks. Eli says he's definitely going to the Mystic Aquarium. That's just a cool thing to do anyway. And again, show him what you got. Take some cool pictures if you don't want to lug it in there. All right. So when I saw this slot in the back, you know, you go, you go piggy bank or whatever. You're like, but then it dawned on me. I'm like, hey, that top is fixed on there. That sounds, that's pretty crazy. And when Mike said how tall it was, I had an idea what it was. But then when he said the size, I was really impressed. All right, what this is, is a money box, all right? This was literally a bank for back in the day and how sometimes they'll call them wedding or Christmas boxes, uh, but this, this is a money box and you would literally keep your coinage and your money in it and then bust it open. They generally were not this large. This is quite large and quite impressive. I think it's an important piece, an Americana piece. I got really excited because most of these are English. All right, most of these are um, most of these are from England, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So if you look at do do do, so like a uh, redware, redware money box. See what I'm talking about here? All right. So most of them are, are English. There were a few made here in the States, but most of these, when you dig into them and, and really look into them, you'll find out like these slipware, these are all British. Okay. And the form, note the form that, you know, some of them start to have this, this honeybee and you start looking at them and I, I know it's, um, I know it's, um, it's American, but when I saw I got super excited when I started going down the English road because when I saw this, I went, oh my gosh, I know what it is because there's one called a Tudor box. And if you know the Tudor family, the, the Tudor family, they have what's called a Tudor rose. And I got so excited because I thought the queen of England and it's a Tudor rose and it's going to be on a money box. And I thought I had solved it, but the rose is not the same rose and it's not see the symbol? I thought that's where I was going and I got really excited, but I was wrong. So then I thought the German Pennsylvania Dutch and the Pennsylvania Dutch, and I got on to food molds because what I was looking for was that exact pattern. So look at a flower food mold. Okay. Let's look at an antique one. So I don't look like a crazy person. Now, see these antique ones? See, uh, let me find a real antique one. Show me an antique. See these designs and they're incised? So we know this is an incised money box. We know that it's not a skull. We know that it's got that English or Pennsylvania Dutch flower on it. And we know it's large. I believe this is an important piece. And Mike should probably have one of the large pottery museums look at it. I found this great group. Um, I'll show you money boxes, tutor. 
it almost sounds like hakes. It's like hoags or something like that. Let me see. Hoags. Do, 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 do. The way I found it was, I know you're on here, but I also, of course, went to Pinterest. And again, Pinterest is starting to get really good with these. And you see these Scottish, English. A lot of these are English, but there was a, I'll send it to you, Mike. There was a, oh, Pook and Pook might be the guys to contact about it. Uh, Pook and Pook, which isn't far. Oh, here it is. Iver Noel Hume. This is who it is here. Iver Noel Hume. Again, you see how I just literally jump it around. These pot could talk collecting pots, ceramics in America, chipstone.org. There it is. These guys were literally, they, they have, they wrote a, a blog just about money boxes contact this chipstone and let me know what they uh, what they tell you and follow up with me next week because I want to know. I really want to know what they tell you. I think it's a really important piece. And Ironstone like this could, Redware could sell for a fortune. I gotta, I'm watching my time and I want to get into another piece for you guys. I actually want to give you an update that I think is really uh, epic. Well, it's not. It's not epic yet. It's just going to drive me crazy until it is epic because I know it's going to be epic. All right. Okay, let's get into this. We're going back here because I'm taking you down my crazy train. All right, remember my friend here? Okay. You remember this crazy device? I want to show it to you again. Okay. Let me show you this side. All right. And so you know, this thing's this thing's about five inches long, has all this crazy business on the back, crystals wrapped with copper, you know, kind of steampunk looking on the back. All right. I want you to look at this, and I want you to look at this closely. Now, this fragment came with it. Now, see the symbolism? I want you to see. Uh, see the sim. Oh, let me flip it upside down. See the symbol, how it's exactly the same. It's like it was copied. And and note note the color. See the lapis and the turquoise and the coral and the opal and the malachite. Now see this piece. Don't they appear to be of the same age and ilk? Yet this looks more modern. I think this is an add-on, this fabric. I think this piece... And again, it does not open. It is thin. It does not open. It's heavy. And this are of significance. I believe this was the, this was a part of some original original uh, piece of jewelry, and then this was created after it to. And again, this came from the estate of Catherine K. Phillips, docent of the Phoenix Art Museum friend of Tama Rufino Tamayo. And I believe there's a lot more to this story. I believe it's quite possible. Now I had some experts chime in, um, on my monad theory. And let me show you the M monas hieroglyphica. Sound crazy. All right. Monas hieroglyphica. All right. Do, do, do which is really crazy when you start researching this because it gets into all sorts of occult stuff and and it's been hijacked by the way this was not this did not start off as black magic or anything crazy like that this was uh alchemy and um it was a science you know they were trying to figure out how to turn uh lead into gold and they worked for kings and queens and and were using science and because that they were witches and blah 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 blah. Anyway, long story short, uh, John D. You want to hear something really crazy that someone uh, pointed out? Uh, alchemy, the birth date of alchemy in history, and is February eleventh, eleven forty four. My show about this was last February 11th. I had no idea, but that's kind of weird. So just throwing that out there. But again, my curiosity is who made this? And is it what I think it is, which is a talisman to reflect the, you know, the monad, 
Is that what it is? Or was it, or was it, is it just a random piece of art? I find that impossible to believe. I do know that, um, Catherine was into, uh, some mysticism in the sixties. Everybody was into stuff. She also was hanging out with the artist Rafino Tamayo. And like I told you, I, I really was going down that wormhole that all the artists like, uh, Calder and, and Picasso and they were all making, and, and Dolly, they were all making jewelry at this time. And I thought it possible that this had been created, uh, by, by that artist. And it's funny because that someone gave me a little tip. Uh, Los Castillo, which is a famous um, uh, sterling silver Mexican uh, a company. It's a it's in Taxco, Mexico. They make all sorts of Mexican silver. Um, they actually have Mayo actually made uh, a few pieces of jewelry for under their name. All right. So you see this piece right here. This is just a little pin, mixed metals. But if you look at the construction and the nature of the work, it's very similar. So it's quite possible that the theory is correct that this is Rafino Tamayo. So I'm going to go down that road. I'm going to contact the Phoenix Art Museum and see if they have anyone there that can get me in contact with uh, people to uh, dig a little deeper. Because while I got the door knocker, I might be able to get some information because the door knocker should get uh, the Tamayo Foundation to uh, talk to me. But then I want to know if there's any records of him making any jewelry because I want to know more about this piece. Because I'm telling you, this piece truly has a presence to it. I don't know if you know that, but I mean, I I'm not a wacko. Well, everyone knows I'm a wacko, but... I literally, it has energy. It really does. It, I, I, I feel like if I wore this in Sedona, I might levitate. I'm not kidding. So actually I'm kind of kidding, but not really. It's so cool. I really hope you guys like it. So I know we got to wrap up here. I got three minutes left. So I just want you to know this was, what is this? Solving your mystery finds. I didn't really solve a lot tonight, but I told you how to do it. I hope you got some free tips there with my, uh, um, free ask art, a way to look around on ask art, live auctioneers, how to look things up. And again, I also hope you notice that anybody that sent me anything, I got back to them and I helped them. And I will really do my best to help you. If you send emails to Josh at joshlevinespeaks.com, I would really uh, look forward to solving some of your mysteries. You'll find, I got a lot of pieces of art this week and I've solved them. I, I literally just sent them the answer because again, I just wanted to give you a couple examples of that. But I love, I love showing you how to use these free tools. And really why I'm doing this show is I love sharing the education of this. Um, I'm still having a problem with uh, some of my stuff up here. And thanks for bearing with me. I'm a little more articulate than this. And I'm, I, it's kind of like having five distractions going on while you're doing it. Plus, my two-year-old is out there making all sorts of crazy noise that you can't hear thanks to my noise gate of my Rode microphone. So, uh, it, But anyway, I love it. Subscribe to my channel. Send me your mysteries. Check out my blog. I'm always posting at joshlevinespeaks.com forward slash blog. If you just go to my blog, you'll see I like to post auction results each and every week of what's happening, what's hot, what's not. Actually, I never focus on what's not. But I show you auction results from all around the U.S., not just on my show uh, last week at the auction, but also in my blog post. I like to give you tips and tricks and what's hot and what to look for at yard sales and estate sales, because maybe you'll make a little extra money doing this. All right. Everybody right now needs a little extra money, even, and by the way, even with uh, the, uh, the country we live in right now, I still, there's yard sales every weekend. So there's yard sales, the thrift stores that were open through the pandemic and, and everybody's shopping online. So there's a lot of opportunity there to buy and sell. And the best way to learn about this stuff is, I've, I've honed it all down into my show last week at the auction shows you 10 items and 10 auction results from 10 different genres every week. And it's like a, a, a free education into what's going on in the secondary market. So you don't have to surf eBay and find out what you like. 
and and what the prices are are doing in your genre, you might be able to learn other genres. Because what I found is, if you know a little bit about a lot in this business, you can't get hurt by a trend. Uh, when furniture prices go down, uh, you can get into costume jewelry. When people don't want costume jewelry, you can get into art. Art's always where you're going to find bargains at, at the thrift stores, and you'll always find a few bucks you can make there. So it's just you have to know how to research these things. And with these tools I'm going to give you, it's it's a great. And once you're making some money, then you can step up and pay for some of these. Uh, if you ever want the few, I, I can send you links to any of them that you want. Uh, if you have any coins, I have some great uh, cheat sheets I can send you. I'm always looking to help you guys. And again, people say, what do I do? That's what I do. I help people figure out what they have. And I make crazy YouTube videos, which aren't that crazy. Actually, if you knew me, I'm just trying to make educational videos. And I have an amazing new series I'm going to be working on. Uh, you guys are the first to hear about it. Um, it's where I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to show you how to make a, a chunk of money uh, just live, like road trip style. It's going to be pretty cool. So it'll be a series coming up. But anyway, I will see you next Thursday. And I'm sure I'm going to have a bunch of cool new stuff for you. In fact, I know. And hopefully I'll have an update for you on a few of these pieces. I hope somebody gets back to me about this crazy necklace. So this was What Is It? with Josh Levine. And we're solving your mystery finds. Thank you guys so much. I think we went over an hour. Thanks for sticking with me. A lot of you stayed tuned in. I really thank you. Thank you so much. If I missed you in the chat, I'm just so excited my chat finally worked this time. So thanks, John Kastner, who says good show. Hey, everybody. Thank you so far. Everybody likes it. Oh, no. Some people said I'm too choppy. Anyway, thank you guys. Take care. Have a good night.